today we're going to take a look at America's first governments, right? The, the first national governments, the kind of latter stages of the Second Continental Congress and the Articles of Confederation, and the first state governments that are formed during the Revolution. Now, I want to begin, uh, you know, perhaps at some point in the past, in high school, in some other class, in the textbook, you, you come across a certain evaluation of America's first governments, particularly this Articles of Confederation. And th there's no hiding this, that it's one of the favorite pastimes of early American historians and teachers to really beat up on the Articles of Confederation, to really sort of decry its inefficiency, its um, exuberant ideology that sort of led to instability and insecurity. And again and again, in a very short period of time, between you know, 1780-81 through 1787, the Articles of Confederation failed to, to measure up and to address a host of national problems, uh, national issues, and this produced real crises, real insecurities, real instability, you know, ultimately resulting in, in uprisings like Shays' Rebellion. And the narrative typically follows that you know, this first somewhat ideological, overly democratic attempt at national government was uh, properly replaced by a more mature, more sophisticated, more centralized and powerful and certainly efficient national government to the benefit of everyone and certainly to the benefit of American history. And largely speaking, that narrative is correct. I mean, that is, that is a pretty good assessment of what happens. However, I am troubled as a historian and as a teacher of history by only evaluating a government on its efficiency, right, on its efficacious ability to meet present crises or, you know, uh, contemporary issues. That in a larger sense, I'm uncomfortable with the idea that being ideological, particularly democratically ideological, is foolish and that only its foolishness should be evaluated. Then I think, perhaps with a, a slightly broader look, a different sort of consideration of this Articles of Confederation and these first state governments, to be sure, we might get a broader sense of something else that the Articles of Confederation gave us. It helped cultivate certain revolutionary seeds of liberty that grow and flourish throughout the rest of American history that I would say in many ways we benefit from today. You know, if efficiency is the only model, well, dictatorships are more efficient than democracies to begin with, right? And so that can't be the only way we evaluate this. And so <clears throat> let's take a look, a deeper look at our first national and state governments during and after the revolution. And we're going to ask a couple of, of questions, right? We want to take a, a broader look at why did they actually choose this form of government and the form of governments? Because this is a unique moment in history. They get to choose their government, build it from the ground up. And, you know, why do they choose democracy over efficiency, right? This is a choice and it's an active choice in many cases. Why do they choose it? And I also want to talk about the successes of these early governments because in these successes, these sort of historical ideas of success are um, the components of history we need to recall to put the Articles of Confederation in its proper place, to understand the longer narrative of revolutionary liberty and democracy throughout American political history. So moving along, I want to, as we look at these American first governments, I want to bring up another dichotomy. I just introduced one, democracy versus efficiency, or we could say ideologically driven governments versus efficient, pragmatic governments, right? That's a dichotomy. It's a choice. Another choice, uh, and this is kind of another political science theory, as you all know, I like to, to discuss, any entity, any community, any nation, any state, any society, always has to sort of negotiate between competitive dichotomies. And another one, along with ideology or democracy versus efficiency, is uh, a longer, more grander history of one called liberty and security. That another thing that 
the early American governments had to choose and continue to choose and continue to negotiate between is a liberty and security. And we still negotiate, all societies from the beginning of history, all societies have to strike a balance, have to strike a negotiation one way or another between liberty and security. And this isn't an equal balance, maybe balance isn't even the right word, but one way or another, societies, communities, states, nations, empires, they negotiate between these two, one and the other. And they exist sometimes in a reciprocal relationship, an inverse relationship. We go, before we go any further, let's work with a few quick and easy definitions. In many ways, these definitions won't be complete, but it'll give us something to talk about. Liberty and security. So what is liberty? You know, it's, it's, it's something we talk about. It, it's an idea that we sort of have the meaning of, but I'm going to give a fairly simple definition of liberty here. I would say that liberty is the ability of an individual or a group to do as they want, to do as you want without the coercion or control of others. It's pretty simply put, right? There's that sort of natural, according to Locke, inclination towards doing what you want, right? That no outside authority or external authority controls what you do. That's liberty, the ability to make choices, to pursue your interests. And when we expand this, into more of a political sense of liberty, right? Liberty is this idea that, that a community or an individual possesses inalienable rights, certain natural rights that no authority, legitimate or otherwise, no other person uh, can take away or ought not take away, right? That's the sort of expanded political idea of liberty. But it's about choice and freedom and the ability to do as you want without interference, in a pure philosophical sense. On the other hand, what's security? Security is a little more nebulous, a little harder to define. I go with the idea is this, that security is, and it's usually given to an individual or a group or society, a guarantee, an assurance, or a promise of stability, of a certain amount of freedom or alleviation of the fear of death, fear from violence, fear from loss and destruction of private property, right, or destruction of your person. It is uh, a promise or an insurance that agreements will be upheld, right? It guarantees certain uh, uh, reliabilities in the present, and it allows you to plan for the future. That's the real key of security. It sort of guarantees that you can make choices now that will be upheld in the future. So it's about a sort of collective assurance or guarantee, right, of, of stability, of freedom from fear of death and violence and destruction of property, and that contracts and agreements will be upheld. It can never be an absolute guarantee, right? It's not necessarily an absolute, but there's enough of an assurance. That's security. And this is pretty commonsensical, right? All communities, all societies, all nations, in all history, strike a balance between the two, right? Balancing, or sometimes they don't strike a balance, but they have to negotiate or work out between the two. The individual desires or, or communal desires to do as they want, to make choices about your own future and present, versus the needs of security, the guarantees of stability, not just in the present, but into the future. And this, of course, is a fundamental role of government, all governments. And surely, as I said, all societies negotiate between uh, liberty and security. And America is no different, right? And I should also add that few societies, few societies really make an active, conscious, present choice, right, to set the limits and determine the relationship of liberty and security, right? America has a very unique balance between liberty and security, but that's inherited. Right? That comes from a long history of experience. It comes from precedent and customs and traditions. We're born into it, by and large. Our expectations are set by historical experience, like most places around the world, like most points and times in history. And certainly, there are certain points in history or events that send shockwaves right, through this relationship and force us to maybe renegotiate liberty and security. And in the 21st century, you know, the clearest example for Americans is, you know, post-September 11th of 2001, right? We've, we've forcibly and actively 
renegotiate and reconsider and rework in a very active way the relationship between individual liberty and security. But even that, even the arguments and the precedents we fall back on to, to make that negotiation are mostly inherited, right? We've inherited these from history. They're mostly already part of our society. Except for one type of society actually gets to choose from the ground up to openly negotiate and set the rules of liberty versus a, a security or set that balance. They also get to choose between ideology and efficiency. And these are post-revolutionary governments, right? These key points in history, one of the reasons we love revolutions as historians, and not just the American Revolution, is it's a point of possibility. Successful revolutions, now failed revolutions have a different history, but a successful revolution is almost immediately faced with this uh, maybe enviable or unenviable task of creating society, creating a government, openly and actively negotiating liberty, security, ideology, and efficiency. And this is what the Americans, the leadership of the Americans in the late uh, 70, 1770s, early 1780s were faced with, this task. And again, this is an exceptional to the American Revolution, right? We can look at other revolutions, uh, most notably the French Revolution, another democratic revolution where they openly and aggressively choose extreme ideological liberty and democracy as their form of government. You know, to a lesser extent, uh, we look at the Russian Revolution as a 20th century global example where they choose, if not democracy, they choose ideology over efficiency for their first form of government. And they sort of create this whole new societal governmental model of liberty and security, ideology and efficiency. However, in many of these historical revolutions, they follow a pretty familiar path. These first ideological governments prove themselves unequal to the task of effective government. Insecurity and instability reign quickly in post-revolutionary France and certainly in post-revolutionary uh, Soviet Union, Russia. They quickly break down into purges or terrors where small groups of leaders among the revolutionary elite crack down and suppress liberties. And in the end, in a very short period of time, a decade, one results in a dictatorship, an efficient dictatorship, a mobile warlike dictatorship in Napoleon in France. And, you know, the Russian Revolution becomes Stalinist totalitarianism, right? Sort of the end of ideology. And, you know, in some ways, we have to look at the American because the Articles of Confederation face similar instability, similar insecurities based on their lack of efficiency. However, the American model does not end up the same way. In fact, we end up with something quite different, right? We end up with a stronger centralized government, but a constitutional one, one with enshrined inalienable rights, a Republican-style democracy, which with more or less we still live with to this day. It takes a very different trajectory. Somewhere along the lines, somehow, the seeds of liberty are not only planted, but cultivated prior to uh, 1788 that allow for the growth of this other style of government. You know, in many ways, the successful long-term revolution, the ideologies of the revolution, in some ways are preserved into several sequential historical phases, into modern times. And so I want to look at the Articles of Confederation, these early state governments, and their successes. We're so aware of their failures, and I'll recount them real quickly, but their successes. How does this happen? What role do they play in ensuring a successful American Revolution? Not just a militarily successful one, but a culturally, politically, economically successful one. So let's start with this. Why do they choose this rather weak executive or almost no executive centralized government as a federal government, a powerful legislative body, and devolve most of the power to the states. Like, why do they make this choice? This choice for sort of ideological democracy over efficiency? Well, one reason is rather obvious. It's a revolution. It's a radical time, right? They are waging a war against powerful, centralized external powers, executive powers. And 
they're winning, right? By, you know, the late 1770s, 1780s, they're winning. They're calling people to the standard. This is the era of radicalism. This is when those who hold radical ideologies are the ones most likely to flock to this banner, to be the leaders. In a revolution, you are going to find ideology at the outset trumping efficiency, because that's what revolutions do. Secondly, and this is also almost just as importantly, they had no precedent for any other type of government. You know, the national government, there was no national government prior to this, certainly no national democratic government. The national government was external. It was imperial. The Second Continental Congress, which is the government of the United States, which morphs into and becomes formalized as the Articles of Confederation, they're a collection of influential men from various regions who basically parlay every single bit of their influence, of their personhood, to cajole and drag a democratic-leaning population into an effective war effort against England, right? That's the essence of government for them. And they don't do it with a very powerful centralized authority, extensive powers of taxation, right? They do it more by consensus, popular opinion, vocal leaderships. They have to work with these democratic structures. And so when they form this first government that they want to be a democratic collective government, there is no practical model for them to fall back on. None. There's no other model. Nothing else like this exists on the planet that they can look to. And they themselves have no culture, no institution, no tradition of this style of rule on, on this scale. At the state level, and we do see this, you know, starting in 1777 through the early 1780s, we see this flurry of creation of state governments, and we're going to talk about them in more detail. You know, at the state level, they did have a precedent of government, right? They had had for over 100 years, most of these places, most of this, the colonies, which became states, uh, an experience of local legislatures, right? They had their local assemblies, democratic structures, right? They had a style of local government. However, in their experience, executive government, the governor and the council, right, the more executive function, well, that was always an outsider. They are royally appointed by the king and the parliament, right? They were mostly foreigners. And in fact, if we really think, and we've talked about this in this class, the role of these legislatures, their main role was to protect the populace from these powerful outside executives. They had their tradition of government had an, uh, a sort of inbred hostility to executive centralized efficient government, right? That's what they saw their role. And so when they created these first state governments, they will create very large and very powerful legislatures, representative bodies. They will place most of the legal power there. They will limit the power of these governors, subjecting, you know, they'll have a governor, they'll create an executive branch, but he'll be elected most of them annually, at best biannually, with strict term limits and very little power will rest with, with the governor, right? Most of it will rest with these legislatures. And that's because of their experience. So for these two reasons, the sort of radical ideology, it is in the middle of a revolution, we're forming these governments. They have an opportunity to make a choice about government. Of course, they're gonna choose democracy and ideology over efficiency and centralized executive power. And also, you go with what you know. You go with what you have. And they had nothing to fall back on on a national level. The, the only thing they had was this Continental Congress, which was not executively driven. And on the state legislatures, they had these powerful legislatures. They're defending the rights of the people against centralized governments. So that's why they choose these sort of governments. So let's talk a little bit about this first government, the first national government, the Articles of Confederation. You know, in 1777, uh, they make a decision. Continental Congress draws up these articles and submits them to the states to be ratified. They say, this is the form of national government. They ask the states to commit to it. And it takes a while. It actually isn't formally ratified until 1781. They had to settle some land disputes between Maryland and Virginia first. All these things happen. But the Articles of Confederation by 1781 is the national government of the United States of America during the revolution and immediately thereafter and responsible for all manners of national governing. It has a couple of key components, the way it's organized. You know, it grows right out of the Second Continental Congress and the way they divided up was this, is they, 
Each state, and there are 14 states at this point in time, because Vermont is made a state uh, by 1777. It's a state with its own constitution. And so there are 14 states. And in all 14 states, each one they could elect and they would send a delegation to uh, this national government, the, the, the Articles of Confederation. And each delegation, no matter how many people were in this delegation, got one vote. So one state, one vote. That's how it was organized. And for any policy, any principle, anything they sought to uh, oversee or make a law about or make an agreement on, well, they all, every state as a delegation would vote. And here's the kicker. It had to be unanimous. You had to have a unanimous vote to pass anything. If there was one veto, it scuttled any law, any policy from being implemented. Now, that's extreme democracy. It's to make sure you know, that the states had extreme rights. It's this real fear of centralized power to make sure that we had absolute agreement across the board among 14 state delegations uh, to pass any laws. You know, really, that one rule explains all the inefficiency, all the weaknesses, all the procedural problems of the Articles of Confederation. 14 delegations, each with one vote, one veto nixes all the laws. It was a real struggle for them. You know, they hadn't really accounted for, and these are the great weaknesses, one of the greatest glaring and continuing problems in early American history, all the way up to the Civil War, sectionalism. Each of these states and regions thought of themselves as separate. They had wildly divergent goals and interests, and often they were competitive with one another, economically, politically. A foreign policy or a trade policy that might benefit New York might have been you know, bad for South Carolina, especially if it relied to import or export laws or tariffs. And so they would veto these things. They prevented you know, uh, a really effective, uniform monetary policy from being formed. All of this came down to there's all these competitive interests. The states have the ability to veto. Sectionalism is not only not triumphed over, it's indulged in the Articles of Confederation. And that's really what gave it its, its, its weaknesses, its inefficiency, and led to instability and security. <clears throat> the policies and the powers that were given or what the Articles of Confederation, I should say, were meant to deal with were foreign policy, right? They were given the power to set foreign policy, make treaty alliances, uh, foreign economic policies, and trade alliances with other countries. They were expected to do that. They were expected to create monetary policy, print currency, control the flow of currency, control national debt, the finances of the nation. Uh, they were What they didn't have the power to do is, one, they were given no direct powers of taxation. Right? They could ask the state for funds. They would submit a bill to every state saying, we need this from you. But it was up to each state to decide whether or not they were going to give it. You know, in 1785-86, the Articles of Confederation are on the verge of bankruptcy. And they ask for what is effectively $10 million from the states, and they barely get a $1 million. This is a consistent problem with the no direct power of taxation. And they really never had the ability to establish a uniform commercial policy to make sure that the rules of interstate trade and national policy were the same in South Carolina as they were in Massachusetts. And this came back down to its basic structural organization about that sort of one veto, you know, overturned everything. In spite of that, they had a number of successes important successes that I would like to call our attention to now and, and kind of think about what they really meant. This is maybe their greatest success. And this is one we should never get away from. And I don't think they get enough credit for this. Uh, and it goes with the Second Continental Congress into the Articles of Confederation. They were the government that won the American Revolution. They oversaw this incredible, improbable colonial victory against the world's greatest superpower at that time. They did it. They did all manner of skillful fundraising, clever and intensive recruitment, maintaining ideology and fervor, fashioning and forging all important foreign alliances, particularly with France, right? All of the management, almost by the seat of their pants half the time, of this incredibly difficult unwieldy war effort that involved them to not only deal with high-minded foreign dis uh, diplomats in France, but 
you know, democratic-leaning, wayward, grassroots rebels on the domestic front. They had to coordinate all that logistically, politically, economically, militarily, all towards the effort of fighting this war and winning it. And you know what? They do it. They win. There's really, for all else you want to say about the Articles of Confederation and the Continental Congress out of which it grew, they win the war. It's, it can't be underestimated how important that is. And there's a second piece to that. They negotiate the peace of the war. You know, most of the major fighting ends in 1781, Battle of Yorktown, as we know. But the negotiations go on for several years. And it is not until uh, 1783 that they forge the Treaty of Paris. You know, we have Benjamin Franklin as our head negotiator. And the Articles of Confederation, they are able to negotiate, honestly, a wonderful settlement. One, obviously, we secure our independence. They get a couple other real key rights. Now listen, we can't settle certain debt, debt issues that take a long time to settle. Uh, there's no remuneration for slaves and lost slaves. There are certain things they did not get that they wanted. But you know what they get? Land. They get a lot of land. They begin the growth of America. You know, at the beginning of the war, it's very unclear how big is America. You know, in Great Britain's eyes, the colonies end at the Appalachian mountain chain, right? You know, the Appalachians running all the way up through the White Mountains. That is, you know, the western border of, of, of the colonies. And it could have been the western border of the United States of America. But through really skillful diplomacy, we're able to start off America as a fairly sizable half a continental nation where we get pretty much all of the land west to the Mississippi, all land north of Florida. Florida gets returned to the Spanish for a period of time. Uh, we get all the land around the Great Lakes and all the way up into what is present day Minnesota. You know, the upper Midwest, the Ohio Valley, right? Formerly, this is given to us, you know, and the British had strong alliances with the Native Americans there. A lot of the war had been started over preventing America from getting and controlling those territories. So this is a wonderful boon. The Articles Confederation, you know, as far as America is concerned, it's not a wonderful boon to the Native Americans living there, but it's certainly a boon to America as a nation. Land. We begin this as a sort of large, uh, sizable nation. Another thing we get, and it's overlooked, are fishing rights off of Canada. You know, to this day and age, fishing is important. If you'll recall, way back, one of the earliest lectures I did was about the importance of fishing and the settlement of America in the first place. It always remained important. And this was, gave us uh, one of our first reliable international trades that we could hold on to after the revolution. So they pretty skillfully negotiated post-revolutionary America, gave it its shape, its physical structure, and they won the war. The second great success they had may have been a, a success by non-involvement. You know, the Continental Congress in uh, 1777 decides that all of the states should form their own government, should write constitutions. And uh, the first one is Vermont in 1777, and Massachusetts gets, uh, completes theirs, or ratifies theirs, I should say, in 1780. And over the next few years, all the other states would also write state constitutions, form state governments. And, you know, the Articles of Confederation take over from the Second Continental Congress, overseeing and promoting this activity. And in many ways, the writing of these state governments, how they come about, what they represent, and what they do to shape and model our future government's expectations of liberty, political liberty, and government structure, and Republican government truly cannot be underestimated. You know, if, if the blood on the battlefields is sort of the, the heart of this revolution, revolution, the mind of the revolution that survives, survives because of this brief, intensive, wonderful period of state constitution writing and ratification. You know, it was unprecedented. These state governments, and all of them decide to do this, hold conventions. They said, well, listen, we have legislatures that we elect, but this is too big just to have our legislatures do this. Instead, they have what is known as a constitutional convention, which becomes a model for the National Constitutional Convention, where different localities elect intelligent men amongst themselves and send them to the state capital 
to go and write and think about and create a constitution. And so we're clear, what is a constitution? A constitution is the blueprint of government, right? It tells how government works, how government will be uh, organized, how laws will be exercised, where will power lay. It might include uh, a listing of rights and limits and powers of your government. You know, most constitutions are sort of inherited by tradition and referred to as a constitution, British constitution. But the American constitution, these state constitutions, are created and written down practically as a, as, a, as a list of laws and a blueprint we can directly refer back to. And it was done by the people, by popular demand and popular participation. So they send people to these conventions to write the Constitution. But they're not done. Once this Constitution or draft of it is, is you know, uh, finished by this convention, they submit it back to the people to be popularly voted on, to be popularly voted on a yay or nay. We accept it or we reject it. You know, Massachusetts will reject its first draft and send it back again in 1778. Um, that's why it's not till 1780 they actually have one. And what's amazing is they do this in the middle of a revolution. There's a war going on. There's chaos throughout the countrysides, you know. But even so, they knew the importance of this. They set aside time and effort. It's the moment where ideology moves off of the battlefield and into the political minds of the American populace and they actively participate in creating these first state governments. And as I said, these state governments and these state constitutions will reflect the ideological radicalism, the democratic liberty of the times, of the revolution. In many ways, they are first and foremost the institution that enshrines elements of this for, for all of time, or at least into present times. First thing we know about a lot of these state constitutions um, is they gave a lot of power to the local legislatures. You know, most of them would create bicameral legislatures, meaning they would have an upper house, were smaller in number, serving longer terms, and a lower house uh, where there were lower property requirements, larger number of representatives, and most of the power was given to these legislatures. As I told you, they had very weak governors. Another thing uh, that the majority, 8 out of 14, so it is a majority, of these first state constitutions will include is an enumeration or a list of inalienable natural rights and liberties, right? A bill of rights, a list of rights. The first Massachusetts Constitution, the reason why it's rejected in 1778, is because it didn't include a list of rights. It didn't say, what rights do I have that no government, even a rightfully, legitimately elected democratic government, what rights do I have that even they can't take away or transgress? What is the limits on the government's power? That is, and what is their role in protecting these, these liberties? Um, Sure enough, this Declaration of Rights or a Bill of Rights found its way into eight of the first state constitutions. And after some fighting, they were added as amendments similarly into our national constitution. Uh, and the rights are just the rights that we've come to expect. Freedoms of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, right? Uh, protection from unlawful searches and seizures, writs of habeas corpus, trial by jury. Trial by jury is something they all want. This idea that a jury of your peers, independent of a government, will weigh your crimes. I mean, this is a significant right. All of these rights, you know, many of them already existed by common law, by tradition in the British constitutional practice, but the Americans wanted them written down. Show me. Make it a law. Write it down so no one, I don't have to argue, I can say it's right there. It's in the very foundation of our government. And the inclusion of these Bill of Rights, this, this uh, Charter of Rights in these, um, in these first Constitution states governments is the ultimate expression of a population, uh, you know, inflamed with revolutionary passion, making this institutional and permanent. And the Articles of Confederation allow this to happen, encourage it to happen, you know, by having this weaker central government the state governments become so much more important. It allows these smaller democracies to really embrace the best, the best of democratic liberty. Another thing a, a, a fair number of these first state constitutions and governments had was a judicial branch. 
And this is unique. They created a separate judicial branch, a high court system, whose job it was to check the government, review laws, be the final say in all legal disputes. So by 1783, the Articles of Confederation and the Second Continental Congress before them had allowed for and had overseen this rapid, popularly created system of constitutions and governments, these state governments, right? These early, these early governments that had a balance of powers, a tripartite balance of powers, judicial branch, executive branch, legislative branch, had a enumerated list or bill of rights, right? And a constitution. Right, and wrote it down in a sort of absolutist fashion. You don't need me to tell you this. The, the, the line between this and what ultimately becomes the model and the precedent for our national constitution is clear. But it only happens because of the, the framework the first national government set up and allowed and created. There's a final success that has to be discussed with uh, the Articles of Confederation. And this is one that almost every history book lists as a success of the Articles of Confederation, including the text for this class. And that is something called the Northwest Ordinances. And ordinances. You know, 1783, because of the Treaty of Paris, America has ballooned in size, right? Uh, we more than doubled in size in, in really in, in what America is. And we have all this territory that goes all the way out to the Mississippi and all the way north to the Canadian border and to uh, the Great Lakes. And one of the areas we were really concerned about how they would be settled and how they would be organized was what they called the Northwest Territories, right? And these are the territories that would be the modern states of Ohio, Indiana, uh, Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Minnesota, right? It's called the Old Northwest. And we think of it as the, you know, the heart of the Midwest and the upper Midwest and Great Lakes region. And, you know, people were already moving there. Um, you know, the southern areas like Kentucky were already overrun, frankly, with Americans. And so there was a, they handled how those were incorporated differently. But there was this moment, starts in 1784, and it starts with Thomas Jefferson, you know. And Jefferson has so many highs and lows, but the Northwest Ordinances is really one of his highs, one of his high watermarks. Uh, as an American founder, is that he wants to impose both enlightenment rationalism and order on the settlement of this landscape and democratic liberty and the ideology of the revolution. And he sets in motion, you know, he writes the first one and he's involved with the ensuing ordinances, particularly the ordinance of 1787, which is the last one in some ways the most important. And basically the ordinances do this. They create a very rational plan for how these territories would be organized, how they would grow, and how they would eventually be incorporated into the larger United States of America. First thing they do, and each ordinance draws it up a little differently, but by the final ordinance, 1787, they carve them up into territories, territories that basically reflect the states that are there now. And each territory has an, an appointed governor. That's something the Articles of Confederation were able to do there. You appoint a governor and a council to govern them, and they sent to each territory three judicial courts to ensure law and order. Once you had five, oh, and they also oversaw the sale of land. You could buy land at a dollar an acre. They tried to encourage the buying of large plots, 640 acres at a time. But the idea was this. Once you had 5,000 landowners living within your territory, you are granted the right to elect your own local legislature, your own assembly for that territory to, to be involved in self-governance. When you had 60,000 landowners, you were given the right to write your own state constitution and apply for statehood in the United States of America. And of course, once you were granted that, you could elect you know, members of Congress, you could vote on the president. Right? That is the model that, that is set up. Now, these numbers have changed a little bit over time, but that was the original model. And more or less, that is how we incorporate states, right? The, the borders are kind of drawn up ahead of time by a federal government. And based on population and land ownership, there's this process of writing a constitution and then eventually being incorporating, incorporated into the United States of America. It worked. There's something else Jefferson added from the beginning. And this is the one that sometimes is very much overlooked. Before there was an assembly, 
before there was 5,000 people living in the territory. These, this came out with that first appointed governor, and this is the reason why they put three courts in each of these. They gave these territories a bill of rights. Every one of the Northwest Territories, from its founding, before it was a territory, before it was a state, had freedom of press, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, protection, uh, all legal protections against illegal searches and seizures, uh, seizures uh, you know, uh, writs of habeas corpus, rights to trial by jury. And they had a governor and courts in place ahead of time to make sure those rights were protected. So anyone traveling and moving there didn't move away from the revolution, they moved to where the revolution was already flourishing. It is a brilliant stroke. And they did something else. And this is the conundrum of Jefferson. We know Jefferson, the slave owner. But you have to also praise Jefferson, the anti-slave revolutionary. He's one of the great conundrums of American history. All of these territories, from the very beginning, outlawed human bondage, said slavery was illegal. And if you move to that area, this is before the Dred Scott decision, if you move to that area, you didn't get to keep your slaves. It was free from the stain of African human bondage from its inception. You know, in some ways, these new territories that didn't participate or fight the revolution were more revolutionary, more imbued with revolutionary liberty than many of the states that were engaged directly in the American and fought the American Revolution. That's one of the great visions of Jefferson, working through the Articles of Con Confederation. People are right to point to this as a success of the Articles of Confederation, but I want you to really understand the breadth of that success. It didn't just create an orderly and enlightened way to systematically incorporate territories into states without having lots of border wars and disputes over who controlled the states, whether or not they would be equal to states that already existed. That was all brilliant and set a wonderful precedent. It also made sure that the ideology and the values of the revolution and its enlightenment and its liberties were there from the start. That Anyone moving there was met with the revolution. They didn't have to import it. Now, none of this, none of these successes or lessen the role the Articles of Confederation and its inefficient style of government played in the struggles and the vast and quickly growing insecurities of political and social life in early America, right? Um, <clears throat> it did fail miserably to establish foreign policy, to create new trade relationships that we desperately needed once we were cut out of the English mercantilist system. It never effectively taxed or raised finances or could meet the, or could meet the demands of debt, both national and foreign debt. And as we know, and you know from reading the text, and you'll see as you watch some of the films in this lecture, in, in this topic series, you know, its flawed and sectionalist monetary policy led directly to social upheaval, specifically in Shays' rebellion, but in other upheavals, right? This sort of unfair monetary policy and financial policy uh, and, and the Articles of Confederation failure and inability to address it, I mean, directly leads to that. In some ways, maybe it's not fair to say it causes the chaos of the 1780s, but it in no ways alleviated it and truthfully had no power to alleviate it. And I think we can say, thankfully, America's leaders and its population collectively decided to replace it with something better. Something that, yes, perhaps traded in a certain amount of ideological liberty and democracy and replaced it with stronger centralized authority and more security but we have to think a little more broadly about it too. So, in summation, let's review the three successes of these first governments and briefly consider their significance and their meaning. The winning of the American Revolution and the wonderful negotiations of the Treaty of Paris that won the revolution, creates America, and creates the shape and the scope of America. The allowing and the encouraging and the of the flowering of these state constitutions and state governments were really these, these early seeds of American liberty are allowed to take root, to grow and to spread, not just in the 1780s, 
but throughout American history, the residue is still there, and we should be grateful for it. And of course, these Northwest ordinances, which continued that same project started in these state constitutions, this sort of revolutionary process towards con constitutional um, ratification, those seeds are transplanted to these new territories. Not only would they be brought in in an orderly fashion, they would be brought in with the branches firmly set of American liberty. All of that, we can't take that away from the Articles of Confederation. You know, like I said, when we look at this, if we merely look at it as a story of efficiency and failure, you'll miss the larger picture. Yes, it was inefficient and it failed, but it was successfully replaced. And the things we chose and the government and the political culture and the societal culture we chose to replace it with was encouraged, was planted, and cultivated during that very short period of time in America's by America's first governments. Thank you.